the Russians are in a population collapse, not as severe as what's going on in, say, Germany or especially China, but still terminal and still to the point that the Russians are going to be able to cease to function as a military force within about 10 years and with a, as a national force in 30 to 40. We can see the end of this. They believe, and I think they're broadly accurate in their assessment, that unless they can reposition strategically in a way that is not as manpower intensive, that they're lost. So if you look at the post-Soviet borders of the Russian Federation, they've got about 5,000 miles of contact with other powers that could potentially be hostile. But if they can absorb all of Ukraine and then the next tier of countries beyond them in order to anchor between the Black Sea, the Carpathians, and the Baltic, that 5,000 miles shrinks down to about 500 miles, and they can maintain that security perimeter with a much smaller military. So we're in this weird situation where, uh, I guess it was Catherine the Great who put it the best. As your empress, my legacy shall be expanding Russia's borders. And if they can get back to roughly the old Cold War system, that is a more secure position for them that they can man with fewer troops. What we discovered, however, in the first month of the war is the Russian army isn't an army, it's a mob. And if they are successful in crossing Ukraine and then taking the battle to Romania and Poland, which can actually control those access points, they'll come up against NATO, which is the best military force the world has ever seen. And they don't have a chance of winning in a conventional force there. So they would have paid all of the prices for a major war, gotten none of the benefits, and then facing a conventional battlefield defeat. So I would guess, I mean, there's a number of ways that this could go, but if I would guess that the day after Ukraine falls, the Russians reposition their forces, get ready to march on the Danube and the Vistula and, and Warsaw, and call up Paris and London and Sweden in Stockholm and say, look, we're going to fire nukes at your cities tomorrow unless you publicly repudiate the NATO alliance with Romania, with Poland, with Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. You let us know what you decide. The missiles fly at noon. Some version of that. That's the negative scenario. Mm. I'm not sure how I should say this. That That is the Ukraine loss scenario. And that is the path that we risk being on now. The flip side is if Ukraine wins and achieves everything we've always hoped and gets all the Russians off of all of their land, it's not enough because the Russians now have launched a major war and not gotten the benefits of it yet. So they will try again and again and again and again and again. And that means that for the Ukrainians to be secure, they have to neutralize the logistical hubs within Russia proper that allow to gather and launch conflicts. Those two cities, Belgorod and Rostov-on-Don, you know, they're on the wrong side of the border. And if the Ukrainians do something to neutralize them, then the Russians will feel that they have to launch nukes for defensive reasons. So we're in this weird, horrible holding pattern where the best case scenario for everyone except for the Ukrainians is for the war to stay in Ukraine. If the Germans and the Swedes and the Brits and the French agree to give the Russians everything that they want, then maybe nukes won't be used. But I think if there's one thing that we've seen out of Putin and in Europe in general is that when you give a dick everything he wants, he asks for more. The Vistula and the Danube are the minimum criteria for the Russian success. They're not the maximum. That would include Berlin. That would include all of Hungary. That would include all of Romania and Bulgaria. Predicting what people are going to do in that situation is obviously difficult, but to think that everyone in NATO has a military is just going to roll over, that ignores a lot of European history. If Russia fails here, they'll be unmoored in their own territory and lacking enough people in their 20s to launch another conflict. Continue at the current pace they've been going for the last two years for at least, at least another four or five uh, before they run out of equipment and men. But this is the last generation of Russian men in their 20s. The birth rate just collapses after this. So if they were going to do it, they had to do it now. And they are preparing for a world where they have very, very few men that can patrol their own population as well as their external borders. So this is Russia's last major war. And after this, it's just a question of the long fade. And does the long fade happen over two decades or does it happen over seven? They're fighting for time, plain and simple. <laughs> Everyone in my field was convinced that the Ukrainians ultimately wouldn't have a chance. Now, I would say that I was one of them that was most optimistic. Mm -hmm. I'd seen the efforts towards national consolidation and military shifts in the post-2014 era is very, very positive, but not enough to make them last more than a year. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so uh, in the first month of the war, when it looked like it was almost all over, uh, with the assault on Kiev, we're like, wow, I knew it was going to be quick. I really didn't think it was going to be that quick. And then 
the military advance by the Russians stalled and dissolved. And I was like, wow, didn't see that coming. I knew that the military in Russia wasn't as good as they said it was, but I thought it was still the second most powerful military in the world. And now here we are two years later and everything, every assessment I think that everyone made pre-war has been proven wrong. And I think everyone's adjustments have also been proven wrong. So just mm -hmm. my personal story thought that this would be over in a year, here we are. Thought the Russians were more capable, here we are. Thought the Europeans wouldn't step up, here we are. Thought the Americans wouldn't step up, and then they did, and now they're stepping back. We're all getting a fresh appreciation that the term fog of war does not simply apply to battlefield conditions. Uh, and I would love to be able to give you a firm forecast about what's going to happen next, but I don't trust it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I focus on what I see and the implications for the evolutions at the moment, which of course right now, unfortunately, are more in Washington than they are on the front. But I've definitely been severely humbled and anyone who hasn't been severely humbled has not been paying attention and being honest with themselves. It is all over for them either way. The question mm -hmm. is, how do they leave this earth? Mm -hmm. Uh, right now, a third of the population are refugees either outside of the country primarily or elsewhere within the country. Most of the refugees, probably close to 75% are women and children, and mm -hmm. most of the women who adv have advanced degrees have left. Mm -hmm. So they've lost their intellectual capital, they've lost their youth, they've lost their next generation, and they already had one of the world's worst demographic structures anyway as a result of the post-Cold War collapse. And that's before you consider the destruction because of the, the war or social soldiers that are lost, which are almost exclusively under 40. So even if the Ukrainians win here, we are still in the final generation of the Ukrainian state. And considering that there's not a single place that the Ukrainians have fled to, they're throughout Europe. The dissolution of the ethnic identity itself now is pretty much baked into the cake. There isn't a future here. Now, some version of that is true for the Russians as well. The Russian birth rate is officially higher but uh officially the data is made up <laughs> they just stopped collecting it 15 20 years ago so i have no doubt that the russians are in a much a very similar situation so we're looking at this entire eastern european western eurasian landmass depopulating and this region doesn't border a zone that has positive population growth so we're going to get a real world experience here of what depopulation means for things like industrial structure because when you lose the population that's necessary to maintain basic infrastructure you know we've we've never seen that before the closest you might be able to draw upon in the united states is the hollowing out of the steel belt which happened over a much longer period of time and was still part of this overarching government that could shift funds from somewhere else to the rust belt to keep it going ukraine and western russia have nothing like that um, 